So welcome everybody to our panel on how we restore economic growth. My name is Jeff Cutmore. I'll just say very briefly, I think we all understand from that small piece of tape and from uh, what we see around us, uh, how sizable this challenge is. The UN has talked about 255 million people losing their jobs in 2020. We know the World Bank projection for growth in 2020 is that most countries will experience uh, recessionary-like conditions. So I'm very pleased that we've got a terrific panel just to focus on actually how we might think about sustaining and restoring economic growth for 2021 and the years beyond. Let me introduce Bruno Le Maire, Minister of Economy, Finance and Recovery for France, Peter Altmaier, Minister of Economic Affairs and Energy for Germany, Christine Lagarde, the President of the European Central Bank and member of the Board of Trustees for the World Economic Forum, Herbert Dies, the CEO of Volkswagen, and of course, David Solomon, the Chairman and CEO of Goldman Sachs. President Lagarde, maybe I can start with you. Given the recovery is clearly most dependent on the path of the virus at this stage and the lifting of lockdowns in 2021, what is the immediate priority in terms of any further macroeconomic intervention at this stage? Have we reached peak intervention in reality at both a monetary and a fiscal level, and actually it's the path of the virus now that will matter most? Well, Jeff, let me uh, divide 2021 into two sequences, if I may. I think our, our hope is still that 2021 is the year of recovery, but in two phases. And phase one is clearly one that is still plagued with a very high level of uncertainty as vaccinations are produced, uh, supplied, distributed, as we see more lockdown measures, sometimes more stringent, as the variants are also uh, now uh, being uh, rolled out in our societies. And uh, the latest data that we have for the euro area indicates that growth for Q4 is going to be negative, which clearly will have an impact in the first quarter of Q1 in 2021. So we're really looking at a phase one where it is still about crossing that bridge to the recovery, but where the journey seems to be a little bit delayed, but should not be derailed. And in terms of policies, what it means for this phase one, it means that fiscal still has to play a dominant role and has to be very active. At the moment, when we look at the numbers for the euro area in particular, we see that the uh, net balance uh, from a budgetary point of view is going to be negative 6.1%. That's, that's in, in the cards and in, in the books. Uh, on the monetary front, I have said repeatedly, and I'm happy to repeat, uh, that our goal is to continue to support all sectors of the economy and to make sure that financing conditions remain favorable. And that means, you know, from a, a bank lending point of view, bond yields point of view, but that financing conditions continue to be favorable or preserved as such. So that, that's phase one, really, where we have to stay the course and make sure that the situation is favorable. If you, if you then cross that bridge and get to the second phase, uh, where we have, you know, we are on the other side, economy is reopening, then the challenges are different. Because it's, it's not the economy stupid, I was going to say, but it's not the same economy that we are talking about. And it's most likely going to be a new economy, which will be associated with positive developments and also with challenges. I'll, I'll mention four of each. In the positive development, many of our advanced economies, particularly in, the, in Europe, have leapfrogged by about seven years in terms of digitalization. Second, when you look at the way people actually work, it's very likely that about 20% of the time that was worked in offices will be worked from home. Third, technological changes uh, are really uh, affecting and, and for the better, the pandemic affected sectors. And when you look at the uh, VC capital that is being spent on those particular sectors that are affected by social distancing, it's up 56% since December 2019. And finally, and I think that's a critically important point for the longer term policies that have to be adopted now, 
there is a very strong awareness by people that climate change is an issue that must be dealt with as a matter of priority. There's been a survey which was recently conducted by Ipsos, which indicates that more than 70% in, six, in the 16 largest countries want climate change and the fight against it to be their priority. So those four factors are clearly positive developments that will have to be taken into account. On the other side of the challenges that we see going forward, number one, people. When you look at the unemployment numbers, it is not so bad. It's up by about 1.1% in the euro area. But that is really hiding actual numbers that are a lot worse because a lot of people are being discouraged from showing up as looking for jobs because they know that they will not find those jobs. Second, when you look at the low skilled versus high skilled workers, it's the former who have been most affected rather than the latter. You have minus 6% of workers in those low skilled jobs up to the third quarter, and you have 3% up more skilled uh, workers that are being hired in, uh, in our economy. Third one is that uh, lockdowns that are affecting the economy are affecting all companies. Typically, when we have a recession, it plays as, as a cleansing element. The pandemic is actually hitting the productive and the non-productive operations, and that is also going to have an impact in terms of scarring uh, going forward. And fourth, when we look at investment in innovation, that has gone down as well. R&D numbers have gone down, gone down by 14% uh, in the euro area uh, this year in, in 20, uh, well, 2020. So those four factors are going to be challenging when we look at policies going forward, which will have to factor in uh, what uh, needs to be done. And for that purpose, in the beautiful presentation that we saw, digitalization, uh, green, uh, uh, green development and the financing that goes with it, focus on education, helping for the longer term. But it means critically favoring and supporting investment into this new economy. So while both on the fiscal front and on the monetary policy front, authorities will have to stay the course and to continue support. At the same time, investment will have to really be focused uh, in order to lay the ground for a new economy where scarring will have been hopefully avoided or reduced by the measures that will be taken. As you point out, in the short term, monetary policy must hold the course. Can I ask you, there was a change in language around the PEP uh, statement last week. It, it, we seem to move from target to envelope on the PEP and the market took that as hawkish and then we saw things like Italian yields trade higher on the back of that. Was that just a misunderstanding on the market's behalf as to to what extent the PEP, the full 1.85 trillion euros could be used? You know, it was not a new development by any account because it was clearly stated in the statement, as you mentioned, uh, of December, and there has been no particular change in that respect. We took the view that the, the driving, um, the compass that we need to have is favorable financing conditions and making sure that in this world of high uncertainty that we have around, related to pandemic, related to vaccinations, related to lockdown measures and so on and so forth, financing conditions should be a certainty and investors, whether you know, be they consumers or corporates or sovereigns, should feel confident that the financing would be available for consumption, for investment. So it, it, there is no uh, change in what we decided in December. It is still, still the concept of an envelope that will be of the appropriate demand, dimension in order to preserve the financing conditions and make sure that they are favorable for consumption, for investment, by all sectors of the economy. And uh, that, that will continue to be the case. I think I've, I've said very strongly, and I'm happy to repeat, that number one, the ECB will be in the market for an extended period of time. And the ECB will make sure that financing conditions are preserved at a favorable level in order to make sure that we ultimately deliver on the inflation 
uh, target that we have. So it's it's you know no no change in that respect whatsoever since December. And the envelope, as I said, can be smaller if financing conditions uh, remain favorable, but it can be larger if it needs to be larger to maintain those favorable financing conditions. There is no ambiguity and no doubt in our minds. Thank you so much for that. Minister Altmaier, if I could come to you. As we look at this pandemic, it's extraordinary that tariffs are a tax on trade and a tax on growth. How will Europe and Germany specifically persuade the new Biden administration to roll them back? Well, I, I do not believe that we will have to persuade uh, the new administration. My um, uh, personal belief is that um, many of the people I know personally, at least from the past, are already uh, persuaded uh, that we have to rely more on open markets, that we have to rely again on multilateralism. This was something that was highly controversial in the uh, inner U US uh, debate uh, for four years. And now we, we should give them uh, a chance of uh, not only developing, but also um, uh, implementing uh, their ideas. We will engage in a um, very intensive um, exchange of views and uh, ideas. Um, it, is, um, it is a critical situation. On the one hand, uh, we have a recession worldwide, and the poorer countries are suffering much more than the um, wealthier ones. Second thing is, we have learned something some lessons from the past um, uh, recession, the banking crisis. Uh, international finance, as Christine Lagarde has pointed out, um, have remained stable during the pandemic. Uh, we have been able, after the first wave of the pandemic, uh, to reestablish uh, supply chains. Um, and now the question is, can we, can we encourage economic growth despite the ongoing pandemic. And this is something uh, that we should have in mind. Even if some countries like Israel uh, or the UK will manage to have a vaccine for most of the population within a um, month, uh, for others, for poorer countries, it will take not only months, but a year or two until this pandemic is over. And what we have to learn is how can we organize economic growth and success uh, during the pandemic uh, without a further uh, distortion of, um, of level playing fields? Uh, and I see, as, um, as uh, Christine Lagarde has already said, I see a good chance to create synergies, synergies between economic growth and um, climate protection climate policy, implementation of the Paris Climate Agreement. To give one example, uh, and this um, relates to green hydrogen, we have realized that um, green hydrogen is a missing link of energy transition in most of the industrialized countries. Uh, we will have to import it from other countries. So if we could, if we could organize an international green hydrogen infrastructure, uh, where it is produced in countries with lots of sunshine and wind, um, and um, when it is where it is shipped to other countries, or even where industry, uh, because some of the brie products um, uh, will be fabricated with the green hydrogen in South America, uh, in uh, in other countries, developing countries, uh, then it could have. Uh, a very stimulating effect to the world economy as such. Minister, many of these projects require close coordination among Western governments and Western powers. Do you think it was a tactical mistake to sign the China-EU finance deal ahead of the inauguration no, 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 of the Biden administration? <laughs> No, I think, I think this was not a mistake because what we have signed um, um, uh, is a, um, I would say, a, a, a twin, in large parts a twin of arrangements the U.S. already have with China. And it's about creating a level playing field. So I'm, um, I'm very optimistic 
uh, that we can um, develop and negotiate and sign more similar agreements uh, worldwide and that the U.S. Uh, will also follow this path uh, in their negotiations with other countries worldwide. Minister Le Maire, let me come to you. You said last week that you see a change in position in the U.S. on taxing tech giants structurally Clearly, this is part of the restoration of growth. Um, but surely any new taxes at this time send a negative message to all businesses about them investing for growth. How do you balance the two things? Uh, I think that um, you can have two uh, objectives for uh, the short term. Uh, the first objective, as uh, Christine Lagarde just explained, is uh, to continue supporting the sectors that have been the most severely hit by the crisis. And I just want to insist on the fact that um, fiscal has to remain, the fiscal policy has to remain very active since this is not the end of the pandemics. And many sectors, the aeronautics sector, for instance, with Airbus, is um, still asking for more financial support. And it must be clear in all European countries that um, till the pandemic is still striking our economies, we need to have a fiscal support to uh, these sectors. But we also have to think about the future. And as uh, Peter just said, we have to, uh, first of all, invest on innovation, new technologies, and do our best efforts to keep the same level of investment. Otherwise, we clearly run the risk, we European countries, to go out of the technological race of the 21st century. And we have to think about the kind of economy we want to build. We want to build a sustainable economy. We want to reduce the inequalities among nations. And we want to reduce also the inequalities in the international taxation system. The winners of the economic crisis are the digital giants. How can you explain to some sectors that have been uh, severely hit by the crisis and that are paying their due level of taxes that the digital giants will not have to pay the same amount of taxes? This is unfair, and this is also inefficient from a financial point of view. And I think this is very good news that uh, the new uh, Secretary for the Treasury, Janet Yellen, just explained to the U.S. Senate that she was open about the idea of thinking about a new international taxation with uh, the two pillars, first of all, digital taxation, and of course, also a minimum taxation on corporate tax. So I think that we are on the right track. There is a possibility of uh, finding an agreement on this new international taxation system by the end of this spring 2021. And I can tell you that we will do our utmost efforts to pave the way for an agreement. And as I introduced this panel, I mentioned the need to get the vaccine programs running smoothly. Is there a risk that France's slow rollout will delay the speed of the recovery there? No, I, I think that President Macron made very clear that we want to accelerate on uh, the vaccine because we are fully aware that there is a direct link between vaccine and economic uh, recovery. And I also want to make clear that the key challenge that we all have to face is to uh, give a short-term response to uh, the consequences of the crisis I mean the social consequences, the economic consequences on some very specific sectors while building the future. And that's clearly the most difficult challenge that we have to face. Because, of course, the easy solution would be to focus only on the short-term responses. It would be a strategic mistake for all Western countries and especially for European countries. We have to give our short-term response while thinking about the future, remaining in the investment race and the, in the innovation race, while uh, building new technologies, funding disruptive technologies, and thinking about the kind of economy we want to build together.
And can I just follow up on that? Um, if regulatory reform and restructuring is part, uh, part of the key to lifting growth, is it time for France to embrace foreign investment, even if it means that you lose a supermarket or a yogurt maker to a foreign buyer? <laughs> I, I can see uh, what is behind uh, your question. I want to be very clear on the question of uh, Carrefour. Everybody can understand that um, it was not the right timing and it was not the right way of approaching an investment of such an importance in France during an economic crisis. Everybody can understand that. And I can assure you that I'm deeply convinced that the US, if a foreign investor wanted to buy Walmart, for instance, would have given exactly the same response, no. And if in Germany, someone wanted to build, for instance, Volkswagen with a Herbert uh, attending our meeting, I'm deeply convinced that the response would have been from Peter, no. So our response was quite clear. It was no, it does not mean that we are not willing to be the most attractive country in Europe. And I just can confirm that we want to be the most attractive country in Europe for foreign investment. We have decided with President Macron to maintain all the fiscal measures and all uh, the reductions of taxes that we had planned from the very beginning of the mandate of Emmanuel Macron. And we are just out of a very important meeting called Choose France, where many CEOs of all the planet decided to attend the meeting because they want to invest in France. And I want to tell them, you are most welcome in France. Please come in our territory, invest in France. You are most welcome. And do not mix the single question of Carrefour with the bigger question of France and our attractiveness. Minister, thank you so much for your answer. David Solomon, let, let me come to you. Um, President Biden appears to be now getting pushback on the need for another 1.9 trillion package at this stage. Um, we've heard a, a lot of the other speakers talk about the need for fiscal support still uh, through the first half of 2021. But in America, is it actually necessary with consensus GDP forecasts running anywhere between four and six and a half percent? I think your own bank is towards the upper end for 2021. Is it necessary for another 1.9 trillion to be directed at the economy? Uh, so I, I appreciate that question. And there's, there's an enormous amount of focus on the size of additional fiscal stimulus uh, that's necessary here in the U.S. I think one thing's for clear. One thing is absolutely clear. We do need some more fiscal stimulus to continue to bridge the gap, to continue to allow us to move you know, through this tunnel and get to the other side. There's still an enormous amount of uncertainty, as other panelists have talked about in the context of the vaccine rollout and how that will proceed. I, I do think that it's appropriate, though, to think about things in the context of that stimulus that are really necessary right now to drive us through that bridge. There are broader policy issues, some of which we've been discussing here so far in the panel about more inclusive participation over time that clearly need to be addressed, but don't necessarily need to be addressed right now at the end of January. And so I think in the context of bipartisan progress, it would be important to focus on those things that are necessary to get money where it's needed to continue to create this bridge so that we can have more sustained economic recovery until we can get to the other side, until we have more people vaccinated, and then that trajectory can continue. In the near term, uh, I think you've expressed some uh, reservations, or should I say uh, concern about the froth around SPACs and other capital market activity. Um, how real is the risk to financial stability as you see it at the moment? Because obviously, dealing with one crisis, we certainly don't need another. Well, I, I, I think you need to separate the context of the potential for vol volatility and some excess in markets with with the word crisis. And so, you know, at the moment, I'd certainly I certainly see things in the market that are concerning to me. Uh, we have very, very low rates and we're clearly going to have low rates for a long period of time. 
when you have low rates and capital is very inexpensive, it obviously does fuel some speculation. There's benefit, and we need it during the time of the pandemic, of this very, very loose monetary policy, but there's consequence on the other side. I, I do think that it's appropriate to be looking at something like SPACs and thinking about what the consequence of this capital markets innovation can be. As I said last week on our earnings call, there's benefit. I think this is a good capital markets innovation, but like many innovations, it can go too far. Um, and I think at this point, there's an enormous amount of capital being accumulated and the incentives may need to be rebalanced and that needs to be rebalanced over time. I think at some point, the market will naturally flush some of this excess out, but that doesn't necessarily mean when the market flux that, flushes that excess out that we have some sort of a market crisis. It can be just a rebalancing of markets over a period of time. Herbert Deese, the, the pandemic has exposed supply chain fr fragility, uh, particularly for you with uh, global chip shortages. I is the right answer going forward now to manufacture closer to home and with, say, in your case, German or European suppliers mainly? No, I wouldn't say so. We are we are also in the future relying very much on open supply chains and uh, shared distributed labor all over the world. And there are manufacturing sites for specific uh, computer chips, which uh, you wouldn't find in parts of Europe, but not even in the United States. So we have to make sure that the markets remain open, that the supply chains remain intact. And uh, even this uh, pandemic was tough on logistics. Now, we basically, we could manage to get through it. And we have uh, many parts which are really traveling across the world. So our target should be not to become, uh, let's say, regionally fully independent. I think there's a, a big uh, advantage for the world to, to produce in, this, uh, in, in, in different locations uh, wherever there's competitiveness. So that's a, clearly a, a vote for uh, an open trading system here. Let, let, me, let me ask you a, a slightly different question. Um, Christine Lagarde and a lot of other speakers have talked about Build Back Better with a focus on the climate and ESG more broadly. Um, you are grappling with chip shortages. You are grappling with a pandemic. You are electrifying as quickly as you can to meet the new demand for electric vehicles, greener vehicles. But at the same time, you're going to be fined 100 million euros because you missed a climate target. Does that make any sense to you? Isn't that 100 million euros you could better spend in investing in offsets or indeed in electrification? Yeah, definitely. That's, we wouldn't. We wouldn't have. Uh, I'd say we didn't like to pay that fine of 100 million. Now, that happened because uh, we just launched a few of our electric cars in the midst of the uh, COVID pandemic. Now, the Porsche Taycan, for instance, the Audi e-tron. But we missed the targets by a very minor uh, amount, by half of a, of a gram, basically. We reduced our CO2 footprint by 20% or close to 20%, and we will fulfill the targets in 2021. Uh, we think that, uh, let's say, the new targets of climate change is an opportunity for innovation, for, let's say, producing cars and mobility with a lower CO2 footprint. I think for the innovators, if we, we consider ourselves as innovators in that uh, industry, it's a chance. Yeah. Let me uh, bring the, uh, the conversation then back to you, um, uh, uh, Christine Lagarde, Madame Lagarde, uh, President Lagarde. I, I, constantly trying to work out um, what is the appropriate uh, address <laughs> these days. But um, President Lagarde, You're doing let, well. let, me bring this, let, me, let me bring this back to you. Um, we need to see clearly a change that brings about a more equal sharing of the resources and the profits that we generate through global growth. So, so my question would be, how do we make sure that the climate related spending that's being touted now as a pathway to growth is not just another cynical transfer of public money to consultants, lawyers, and private companies? That's a really good question, Jeff, because I think that uh, 
a lot of work has already been done and we've covered part of the journey. In other words, there is a political impetus, there is a momentum, uh, the regulators and the policymakers seem to be aligned, certainly in this part of the world, and determined to address the issue of climate change. The situation that we face is that there are multiple dimensions that need to be addressed. And I would mention three of them. The first one is including, and by that I mean all these externalities that we have tolerated for such a long time. In other words, you know, the, the, the price of uh, destruction of our environment and the cost of climate change, that has to be included so that we have a pricing mechanism and prices that actually reflect the reality. The second is informing because it's also called disclosure in, in proper parlance, uh, but it means essentially uh, respecting the same principles and indicating what efforts are being made in order to reach the net zero uh, levels that is uh, the target. And three, investing. And I think investing in innovation. And the three of them actually come together. Uh, we all have in the back of our mind uh, very difficult experiences of trying to price uh, carbon, of trying to put in place carbon taxation. And clearly, uh, if those measures were taken today, we would be in a different place because there has been more investment in innovation and the cost of non-fossil energy uh, that are now produced has gone down significantly. So when, you know, in, in those days when carbon taxation was a burden, on those who needed the energy. Today, that energy is a lot cheaper and available. So these, you know, informing, investing in innovation uh, and um, including, they come together and then they interact together. But you're right that we need to measure, we need to rate, we need to understand exactly on a, on a granular and standardized basis who is doing what in what sectors. And the last thing that we would need is the kind of greenwashing that would be based on uh, uh, uncoordinated, non-standardized measurements. So as a result of that, we need to have concerted action by all, you, you know, whether it's the rating agencies, whether it is the regulatory uh, principles that apply, whether it is the kind of disclosures that have to be made, all of that needs to work in tandem in order to produce what people actually want. And I think the last thing that they would like to see is that all the public money be actually spent for the benefit of, you know, some standard setting processes and mechanisms that would actually give no results. So it needs, it will not be only achieved by the public sector, but it needs to be driven, measured, aligned and set in terms of principles and targets by the public sector so that private participants can actually understand what the prices are, what the markets recognize, and how risks are managed. And central banks are not policymakers in that respect, but they will do their share as well. And Minister Altmaier, clearly what's critical for the private sector is access to capital. And, let, and yet as we, as we compare Europe and the recovery with the recovery in the United States, it's clear bank lending in the Eurozone, a main source of capital is contracting at this point. Um, structural shifts to market sources of funding seems to be very slow at the EU level. And the UK financial services approval process appears to be now being deliberately <laughs> delayed. Is, is politics at risk of strangling access to sources of credit for European companies who want to make these investments? Well, um, I'm, I'm, um, fortunately, I'm not the Minister of Finance. I'm the Minister of the Economy. So uh, let, me, let me put it like this. Um, what we have very successfully organized in Europe over the last um, uh, six, seven months uh, is um, solidarity with regard to the support measures that were taken. It was to, uh, to avoid harm for the economy, for large parts of the economy. And we were quite successful in this, and that means lower unemployment, it means um, a lower recession, um, and that was uh, quite well done. The second point is, 
uh, we have to unleash um, uh, investment, we have to unleash uh, structural reforms in order uh, to generate the capital and the finance that we need. Um, and this is something um, that is, um, that is uh, not yet, not yet fully achieved, uh, because we have to restore trust in the capacity of Europe to um, defend its industrial base, in the capacity of Europe to compete with regard to digitization with other regions uh, worldwide, with regard to, uh, to innovation. Uh, I mean, we have a, a situation that we have produced, produced the excellent startups in Israel, in Europe, in Germany, uh, but most of them became American citizens uh, after a while. So uh, we have to make sure that the European model becomes looks more attractive than it has looked for quite some years. That is the big challenge ahead of us. The um, equality of opportunity as we restore growth is critical, it seems to me. David Solomon, Wall Street has done very well, um, less so the real economy. Wall Street and the so-called 1% did very well from the GFC recovery. Um, as we look further out, what is the right way to level the playing field when growth comes back strongly? Well, I, I, I think, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, Jeff, we've got to continue. We've, we've got to separate actions that are necessary right now from a monetary or fiscal perspective to bridge and get the economy going. And then we have to consider very carefully policies that are more inclusive and allow, as we go forward, broader participation in the economy and solving some of the disparities in the economy that have really been laid bare by the crisis. I think one of the places, for example, that there's no question from a policy perspective we need to continue to focus is when we look at small businesses, which are such an important part of the economic engine of all economies and in so many communities play such a vital role. You know, how do we make sure that those businesses, which have so badly been hit by the pandemic, are supported and that we have the right policy to allow them to thrive as we move forward? So I think we have to continue to think about policy that's sustainable, that brings more people along, that creates the right distribution, so to speak, uh, but also allows the free markets to innovate, bring investment capital into places where you can create new technologies and spur growth. We've got to get that balance right. And I think that's, that's a policy focus that's going to require a lot of work as we come out of the pandemic and continued focus in the years ahead. And Bruno Le Maire, you spoke very eloquently about the need for this and how you see digital taxes as playing a role in this. Can I just ask you to, to pick up the point uh, from the back of, of David's comments? W would you argue, I know there was a lot of talk about how the, the employment support schemes in Europe seem to be stronger and more efficient than we saw very early on in the United States in the early days of this pandemic. Do you think Europe can actually show America something when it comes to uh, guaranteeing an e a more equal sharing of profit to labor rather than just back to capital? Uh, I think that we all have to draw the lessons from the crisis and we all have to learn from uh, one each other. We have to learn from the US and I think that the US also have to learn from the way we uh, faced the crisis at the European level. And one striking point is that for the first time in our recent history, we have taken, I mean, all the 27 member states and especially the 19 members of the Eurozone, the same kind of measures to face the crisis. We have decided to support the employees and I think it was the right decision and it will allow us to have a quick rebound as soon as growth will be back. Uh, the same for uh, the private companies. We have decided to uh, provide state guaranteed loans to um, the uh, private companies, and it will be very efficient because it has avoided us to have uh, two important numbers of bankruptcies, and it will allow us, as soon as growth will be back, to have a quick rebound. And thanks to that kind of measures, I think that we have been able to build a kind of new European economic model, which could maybe inspire the United States. On the other hand, we all have to draw the lessons from the lack of capital, and you just raised the issue, and David also, 
the lack of capital in Europe. This is a major issue. If we want to have more important companies, if we want to be able to fund uh, the new technologies, I mean hydrogen, artificial intelligence, uh, the new companies in the field of uh, data storage, for instance, we need to have a better access to uh, finance and to capital, which means that we have to accelerate on the capital market union and on the banking union. That's clearly a point on which we are too weak. We have to accelerate. I know that uh, Christine shares exactly the same point of view. And we have to do really our best efforts to build a capital market union as soon as possible, to build a strong banking union as soon as possible, and to make euro an international uh, currency as soon as possible. And I want to uh, uh, thank Christine Lagarde for all the efforts she's doing on that direction. Herbert, let, let me give you a, a tricky one just before we wrap up here. Um, China has just overtaken the United States in terms of attracting FDI. Um, I think 40% of your sales now are into China. China is not going away. In fact, as part of the, um, the path to recovery in the West, it seems to me more engagement with China has to happen. How do we negotiate the challenge, though, of engaging with a partner who at times doesn't seem to play fair and crosses the line when it comes to the treatment of many of its own citizens? I think that uh, China is uh, moving in the right direction. I think the treaty between Europe and China is a good move forward. Uh, we just uh, last year, 2020, we could really, we could make sure that uh, two of our joint ventures are now majority owned by Volkswagen, which was over 30 years, basically, <clears throat> since we are there, impossible. We have uh, bought a major stake in one of the major battery suppliers. So actually, for me, it feels that it's easier to invest in China than China is allowed to invest here in Germany or in some other pages. So we are clearly advocating for a further opening up of China, for a further commitment towards China, and for a multila multilateralism, which also uh, allows, uh, always on a fair basis, and I think always we have to negotiate hard with China because it is an unbalance, it's a huge market, they have their own interests, but they're also depending on the West. We are depending on China. So let's get back to a, a world where we benefit from each other development and not just try to isolate and make uh, uh, things for ourselves. For us, China is a huge opportunity. China also technologically is advancing fast. We are the biggest automotive or car manufacturer in China. We have a strong asset there. We have many development engineers there. And we are developing in China also technology, which we are then using in Europe and in the United States. So let's get, and I really, I have high hopes that uh, after that, uh, I hopefully it was a transition period where let's say uh, the world became smaller and more isolated and, and polarized again. We are hopefully heading back to a more open world with free trade and, and uh, hopefully at least bilateral agreements, but hopefully worldwide agreements for open trade. I think it's much better to try to cooperate and work with China than try to, to isolate China. Also, just as a last point, as, as this was probably your, your, your point, no? uh, uh, addressing us that also if, uh, and, and we cannot, uh, uh, let's say, we share not the same value uh, like in China, and we see clearly that uh, the de democracy is not probably uh, developing fast enough, but still, I think, trade, communicating, be is there, being there, participating uh, uh, is much better than moving out and, and leaving China. Uh, and let me finish uh, with an audience question. Um, and thank you, everybody, for, for tuning in to, to watch our panel here. Uh, and the question uh, is for you, uh, President Lagarde. Uh, Jody Padilla writes from Global Shapers, how do we build this new economy, this recovery, that recognizes the importance of women's contribution and re reinforces its economic value? Certainly by bringing more women to the table. And uh, various countries have demonstrated through the use of quotas, of targets, of minimums. France is one of them that actually now has uh, 
40% of women on the board of companies, that progress can be made and that women can do the job just as well as men. Thank you very much. And thank you very much. And thank you to Minister Le Maire, Minister Altmaier, Herbert Dees and David Solomon for joining us on this panel. And thank you, everybody, for, for tuning in.